Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you uh, so much for joining us. I hope you had a great lunch. I hope you were caffeinated and well fed. We've got a really awesome panel to kickstart the afternoon. Um, as you probably know from the title, we're uh, talking all about transport and logistics today. So hopefully that's something that's really relevant to a lot of you. Um, but something we were talking about when we had our prep call last week was how transport and logistics is more so than a lot of industries. It's really not a discrete thing. It's something that overlaps with so many other industries, infrastructure, uh, housing, healthcare, so many things like that. So hopefully there will be loads of great stuff in our conversation today. Um, so I'm just going to let the panelists introduce themselves. So we'll start on the uh, left. Um, so I'm going to ask you to introduce yourselves, tell us a bit about your company, but also as a bit of an icebreaker, I'd like every they're, they're looking at me now because I didn't prep them on this. Um, I'd like everyone to tell me what their favorite geospatial app is that they have on their phone. Uh, so I'll go first, so you've got a second to, uh, a second to think. Uh, so just to introduce myself, my name is Helen McKenzie. I'm a geospatial advocate in Carto's marketing team. Uh, so my background is really in uh, transport consulting, in geospatial transport consulting. So I've been a long time user of uh, systems that these guys are creating and the data these guys are creating. So I'm really interested to hear what they're going to say. My favorite geospatial app on my phone is an app called Too Good To Go, which is a sort of food waste service where you can identify restaurants that are near you to rescue uh, food waste. So that's me. I'd like to start now with Eric and then we'll just move along the line. Uh, yeah, my name is Eric Nielsen. Uh, I work as a lead G GIS specialist at Connected Places Catapult and we are into innovation and uh, yeah, leveling up, I guess, um, in the uh, yeah, urban and uh, transport realm, really. And I think my favorite app must be uh, yeah, what three words, I think. Excellent. Have we got anyone from what three words here? Mm. I was expecting to hear it like, woo. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, Jesus. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jesus. I'm the CTO of Cable Energia, which are our um, EV developer and infrastructure de and transport developer in, in Spain and Portugal. And uh, my favorite app, I should go for the company line and say that it's our own app. Fantastic self promotion. I love it. You've got to have that confidence. Uh, Ricardo. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Ricardo Rant. I'm co founder and CEO of uh, Nomon. It's a technology company based in in Madrid that provides uh, decision support solutions for, for the planning and management of transportation systems. Um, essentially what we do is, is um, analyzing, processing um, different types of geospatial data coming from uh, mobile devices. We work with, for example, with mobile network uh, data. We work with Vodafone here in the UK, for example, with other mobile network operators in other countries. We integrate this with other layers of, of data, such as GPS data, smart card data, etc essentially to um, describe, um, understand, and predict the mobility of people, vehicles, or goods. And my favorite app, I don't know, I guess I'm a very boring person. I don't have a favorite app, I guess. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> There's many good ones to choose from. Sometimes it's difficult. <laughs> and last but not least. Yeah, so hello, good afternoon. My name is Jeroen Brouwer. I am the manager of the customer program management team at, uh, at TomTom. TomTom is a real big data company, I would say. We collect GPS probe data, and we create some really interesting maps and traffic data with it, which is used by lots of logistical companies, which is, of course, the topic uh, today. And yeah, my favorite app, I can promote the TomTom -Tom app, which is obviously awesome. But if I think <laughs> about uh, an interesting app, then it's the app called Mapify. And that's a, you can see on a map pretty pictures and based on that when you're in a new city you can find all the pretty squares and the nice locations to visit. Sounds amazing, I'll definitely definitely look that up afterwards. So I think we're going to have about a 10-15 minute discussion depending on time um, and then we'll probably open questions up to the audience so as these guys are talking do get thinking about how you'd like to grow them at the end. Uh, so first question, first sort of discussion topic I'd really like to talk about is about decision making using spatial data and spatial technology. Obviously, it's great having all of this data and technology, but if it's not being sort of applied and used to drive decisions, um, then, then it's just sort of good fun. Um, so I'd love to talk a bit about how you guys are using that or how maybe your partners or clients are using geospatial data and technology to drive decisions and also how that's sort of changed in recent years as data um, has changed very much in recent years as tech has developed. Um, I was thinking maybe we'd start with Jesus, uh, because you're sort of working in the EV area, which is something that is generally quite new as well. So I'd, I'd love to start with you, if that's all right. 
uh, for our uh, use of the of the tool. Basically, we, we are not developers. We, we invest in infrastructure. So, so for us, how do you we use geocational data is is key for our investment decision. So, for us, it's really a must. Uh, how do we actually justify, develop, and forecast revenue? So it's a it's an um, informed decision driven by data. Mm, sounds great. Jerome, uh, would you like to? Yeah, so I think a lot of decision making is done based on new geospatial data. And one example is the logistical market. I think about 10 years ago, they were always calculating the travel time based on the rule of thumb. So in the Netherlands, Amsterdam, Utrecht is 30 minutes. But of course, that's not true. And the ideal driving condition is, uh, is maybe 30 minutes. And in the middle of rush hour on a Tuesday, it might be 50 minutes. And what you see today is many logistical management tools, but also the navigation devices are using digital maps and traffic services to properly navigate from A to B. And I think if you compare this whole industry compared to 10 years ago, geospatial data made a huge, huge impact to where we stand today. Um, but maybe for later in the panel, I think there's still a lot that we can do to make it even better. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if people weren't in, in your industry, they weren't thinking spatially. I mean, it's, it's pretty impossible in transport not to think spatially, isn't it? Because it's so ev everything in transport is, is inherently spatial. If you, if you weren't thinking spatially, you just couldn't be making decisions. Um, would anyone else, else like to chip on how they're, they're using data to drive decision making? Yeah, so, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I've, uh, I've been in strategic transport planning for 25 years as well as GIS, and that's from a modeling perspective. And we've always been building our models on quite sparse data, and that's certainly something that has changed a lot over the past, I would say, five to seven years. And, and this, this constant availability of data has changed the game, but there's still a, a long way to go to make most use of it because uh, we are talking about siloed data, we're talking about data that's not really collected for the purpose of transport modeling, we're talking about a, a conservative uh, industry as well. So I think there's lots of ways in which we're not making use of the geospatial data that we have, and that's really continuing a trend that has been going on for 20 years, and I think being here today is really lovely to see data scientists who four years ago didn't know uh, what a geometry was, and now they're here, 60% of you, and uh, who's, who's data scientist, and you want to know about ge geography, and it's, it's amazing. And what we can do going forward is amazing, I think. Uh, yeah, and as you say, everything is somewhere and wants to be somewhere else, except me, of course, and the rest of the panel. <laughs> Yeah, fantastic. I think um, you really touched on an interesting point. I think if, if we'd have thought what spatial data science uh, 2002 or 2012 might have looked like, um, I don't think it would have looked like this. It's fantastic to have two floors full of people coming to talk about spatial data science. Uh, Ricardo, you were going to... Yeah, well, I think I'm going to disagree partially with Eric because we all agree that we need to disagree, right, to make the panel... That's slightly interesting. <laughs> so I think that, that all these new data sources have already had an impact on, on, on transportation and, and the way we do transportation planning, although I would agree on the fact that we still have a long way to go. Uh, basically, when we face a transportation planning project, we need data on supply and data on demand. I think data on, on the supply side improved already quite a few years ago, uh, digitalization of uh, schedules and, and online travel planners, and, and we have good information on supply. And the, the key gap and the holy grail, let's say, in, in every transportation uh, uh, project look at, um, looking at new infrastructure or new services is demand data. And, and I think all these this new data sources we've, we've seen this morning, mobile network data, data from, from uh, um, uh, mobile apps, etc., are, are changing the game, are replacing or, or at least complementing traditional data collection uh, sources in, in transportation. We've traditionally worked with cross-sectional data, with household travel surveys or other types of surveys performed every five, every 10 years. And this was, this was maybe good enough 20, 30 years ago when things changed more slowly. Now things are changing very fast. Um, technology is changing fast. Our habits, our behavior is changing fast. And we need other observation instruments. And, and this is what this new 
uh, geolocation data coming from mobile devices provide us with, with a, a way of observing changes in, in shorter time scales. And we've seen this with the COVID pandemic. I mean, things were changing from one day to another. So, so I think this, this, we can discuss this later, but this will change a number of things in the way we, we plan and, and manage transportation systems. Mm, for sure. I think um, something a lot of you touched on there was um, how having data that comes from mobile devices is a real game changer, particularly in terms of demand modeling, which is fantastic. Um, but I'm sort of quite interested in hearing about the, the people who are left behind in that. So obviously, loads of people in the world don't have a smartphone. I think I remember seeing a stat that something like 50% of the world don't have internet access. Um, and I'm sort of wondering if that's something you guys are considering in, in your roles about if there's anyone we're leaving behind, maybe elderly people or people in areas without access to that data. And is there anything that we can all be doing to sort of bring them along on the geospatial journey with us, whether as end users um, or as people who we're considering when we do our analysis? So, yeah, I can go Sorry, that's that quite one. a... Um, I mean, we, we don't necessarily have this, this limitation always because uh, we, we, you, when we use uh, mobile network data, you don't necessarily need a, a smartphone. We, we can mm -hmm. retrieve, you know, uh, uh, network data from, from, let's say, a traditional normal, normal phone. Uh, so that mitigates the problem, but I mean, in any case, this is temporary, I guess. I mean, more and more people have smartphone and, and uh, the penetration of, of mobile devices, at least with this mobile network data. You can argue this when you, we speak of, of uh, data coming from mobile apps, which are obviously, I think, more more biased, and, and you may have more and more uh, limitations in that respect, but uh, certainly with mobile network data, I think you have a, the best possible data source in terms of gathering a large sample representative of all population groups, except mm -hmm. maybe for little children, but then. <laughs> Great, and I think um, something you also, everyone's touched on is how there's so much more data available now than there once was, uh, which I think everyone in this room is absolutely thrilled about. But we've also talked a bit about data gaps and something you mentioned was demand. And I was interested if you guys think that there's any other big data gaps that are sort of inhibiting the transport and logistics industry, and in what way is that inhibiting it? So, for example, um, I used to do a lot of sustainable transport uh, modeling and analysis, and it always felt like pedestrian and cycling infrastructure was something that was really missing, particularly as open data. I was just wondering if you guys have any any similar... Yeah? yeah I, have a, I have a very specific one, which is more about road authorities. Um, and that's uh, in real-time traffic, you want to navigate from A to B, and you would like to know that the road is closed, right? Or there are roadworks going on, so you can proactively already navigate people around it. With GPS data, you can easily detect a, closed, uh, a road is closed, but that's always after the fact. So after the road is closed, and you don't know the context until what moment will the road be closed. There are a few governments, like Transport for London, they share that information, which is great, because it already means that if I plan a trip for tomorrow evening, I can already navigate through all the closures. But many governments here in Europe do not share this data. They still have a paper map or a PDF file or something on the website. And I think that's an enormous gap for a, a, a smooth experience from A to B, for car navigation, for smartphone services, for uh, fleet and logistics uh, navigation solutions. So I think that's a real data gap. The EU is going to solve it by making it mandatory that governments share it, but that's per 2028, and that's EU, so <laughs> not sure what the UK is going to do. So I think that's a, that's a real gap. The yeah. information is there. It's not digitalized in a scalable way, and I'm pretty sure that there are more examples of this mm. where there are definitely gaps that need to be closed. Fantastic. Has anyone else got any... Yeah. yeah no, I, I was going to say what, what you mentioned, uh, pedestrian data, that's one, one gap, internal, let's say, soft modes. And another yeah. big gap, I think, for the transport planning, especially in cities, is, is data on, on freight transport. I mean, we have mm. very good data sources on, on passenger transport. We have, you mentioned mobile network data, we have smart car data, like Oyster car data. You can reconstruct mobility within the public transportation network very accurately. But the problem with, uh, with uh, uh, urban logistics delivery, it's a very fragmented uh, market. You have a lot of companies competing, data is sensitive. We, need, we still need to find schemes and ways for these companies to share data in a way they feel comfortable, and at the same time, we get a, like the overall picture of, 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 um, of the mobility of goods in the city, because this has more and more impact on, on, on traffic, on transport planning. We've seen the explosion of e-commerce during the pandemic, and this will grow. We've seen a lot of presentations this, this morning on this topic, and this is, this is the gap I would, I would highlight. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, I, 
I'll be very kind and agree completely with you <laughs> and say uh, that the, the, the standardization of these data sets is, is hugely important because you got, you have, we have to realize that this data comes from many different sources. And of course, if you have it in a specific format, you can use it for something specific. But then you get something from another provider and it's, it's different and you got, you will also get government. So say if you want government to collect the data about freight, then will they get it the same way from everybody and, and will we actually be able to use it? So there's some standardization and I'm sure there's work going on in this field, but it feels like it's going to be uh, a more pre uh, pressing thing for the future when we get uh, vehicles uh, with sensors, they're already here, yeah. Tom Tom will say they get sensor data from everywhere to what the speed is. You can get braking, you can get steering, you can get all sorts of things. Uh, windscreen wipers going on, all that. But what is their standard for it? Do you get the same from Volvo as you get mm. from Audi? And uh, when you get p uh, cars on the road with cameras that will actually sense the environment, how do you not drown in data, but get exactly the data you need? And I think this, when this comes and when this happens, or when we make it happen, sorry, then, then it will be great. Definitely. I think we talk so much about sort of single source of truth, don't we, within organisations, and which is obviously such an important thing to try and strive for, but actually single source of truth more generally is really important. Jesus, did you, was there anything you wanted to add I to that? I to build upon your own comments on interoperability and cross-sector cooperation, because for us in transport or in electrical transportation, it would be really good, and I know that there are few utilities around, for having cooperation from energy networks, having interoperability from what Javier was presenting this morning about data sets from different sources, being cooperation and help us doing planning in transportation, knowing based upon knowledge on how the grid is deployed, how the grid is congested, we, we, we are making blind decisions because we do not know anything about, and at the end of the day, electric transportation is an energy vector. It would be great to have some standardization aspects for uh, how the energy and transport sector can cooperate with each other. Brilliant, thank you. I don't know how this has happened because I could honestly sit and chat with you guys all day, but I think we're already at our 20 minutes. I don't know, I can't see our timekeeper. If we have any time for questions from the audience? One question would be great. Anyone? Oh, we've got someone just here. Hi, thank you. Um, I was just wondering, within uh, transport and logistics more widely, which sector you thought might have the uh, biggest challenges going forward in terms of roads, rail, aviation, or shipping? Um, do you, does anyone automatically think that there's a particular challenge in kind of mo modes away from traditional road analysis? I, I think all of them. And the massive challenge is, of course, uh, decarbonisation. And we spend so much of our energy on transport that it's just unbelievable. And if you have to replace that with anything sustainable, so you can take all of them. And of course, so people will say it's, it's, it's uh, aviation that's the worst. But is it? I don't know. Anyone else have any thoughts? Yeah, which, I mean, just, I, I agree again. Uh, I think uh, all of them have major challenges. If we focus on urban transport, I think a, a challenge that has, uh, I mean, has, has acquired more importance recently is, is, is uh, retaining users in, in mass public transit. I mean, there's no silver bullet for decarbonization of, of urban transport, but I think everybody would agree that the backbone of any solution should be mass public transit, um, despite connected cars and emerging mobility services and whatever. And we're losing users in public transport, and this has been worsened by the pandemic. So I think that's that's one challenge we have ahead of us for, for the coming months to, to recuperate levels previous to the to the COVID-19 pandemic. Great, thanks, Jeremy. Yeah, so I don't know the answer because I focus only on one of these four, but I do want to mention that we also need to start thinking more about, about cycling and walking, maybe mode five and six, because also there is a huge opportunity, a lot of things that can be better. And ultimately it would be awesome if we have one solution that kind of fits all six sectors or maybe more in the future, but don't forget about uh, cycling and walking. 
And there's, there's also plenty of opportunity to think about things together, things that could be good for cycling and walking could also be good at reducing congestion and a holistic approach is always great. Uh, Jesus, was there anything you wanted to add to that or happy with everyone's answers? Okay, I don't want to be the person who derails the whole, uh, the whole conference by just talking to these guys all day, even though I could. Um, so thank you so much for listening. Uh, thank you so much to my panelists. I'm sure they'll be around to answer questions um, for the rest of the day if you guys have any more. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. Please join me giving them a hand.